Tony and Hannah Mansing. Tonight, Canada's biggest province breaks another COVID record. The healthcare system is literally on the verge of collapse. A system in crisis as adults are transferred to ICU beds at a children's hospital. Ash rains down on St. Vincent as volcanic eruptions rock the Caribbean island. It will be great for Harry to come back. Buckingham Palace confirms Prince Harry will attend his grandfather's funeral, but without Meghan. There'll be private reconciliation and there'll be public pictures. And basketball star Norm Powell's real talk about race and the Raptors. I've been harassed and still, at least I was doing know that I'm an NBA player. This is The National. Throughout the pandemic, a priority has been protecting hospitals from being overwhelmed. After posting a record 4,456 new cases, Ontario has broken another pandemic record tonight. Its ICUs now have more COVID patients per capita than any province has ever had. Almost exactly three weeks ago, the surge began, unsettling but predicted. That's because daily new cases per capita began to rise more than two weeks earlier. The impact on hospitals almost inevitable and the rate of new infections continues to climb, not just in Ontario, per capita in Alberta, BC and Saskatchewan. Case rates are now in a similar place with Quebec not far behind. And in all those provinces, ICUs are getting busier. That has experts across the country watching with deep concern as nearly 600 patients in Ontario are fighting for their lives in ICUs. Tally Ricci looks at this unprecedented COVID crisis. It wasn't even a thought that we would be dealing with, with this, with this catastrophe. Lauren Barmash Viator's entire family contracted COVID-19. Her father died, her mother needs help breathing, and she continues to suffer from long haul symptoms. This was the variant, so it hit us very hard and very fast. The COVID-19 uh, virus is trying to bring Ontario's hospitals to their knees. Late Friday, the province added two emergency orders, allowing hospitals to transfer patients elsewhere without their consent and non-hospital health care staff can be redeployed to hospitals. It's so strange and uh, frightening to see otherwise healthy young people, but they are being admitted because this virus is cutting them down. Dr. Brooks Fallis is one of those physicians. Working in a COVID-19 hotspot, he says he sees the worst of it and expects ICU numbers could double in the coming weeks. If you get the new variant, you know, you're more likely to be admitted to hospital regardless of your age. You're more likely to be require an ICU regardless of your age and you're more likely to die regardless of your age. Some doctors are making a plea to the government to consider allowing healthcare workers from other provinces to help. I would think the provinces will want to work with one another to find these solutions. This Toronto Children's Hospital is adding eight adult beds for COVID-19 patients. That's never been done before. It is a bit unprecedented for us at SickKids too that we had to become part of a support for healthcare systems crisis like this. I am also afraid that it will get a little bit worse before it's going to get better. A troubling prospect for those seeing the current reality up close now. This never should have happened. And I don't know why it did. I don't know how it did. All I know is, is that it did. So Talia, you're at Sick Kids Hospital, which is taking adult COVID patients. What kind of impact is that having? Well, the president of Ontario's Hospital Association says he applauds sick kids for putting up their hand and saying that they want to be part of this fight. But the eight emergency ICU beds here meant to care for younger adults with COVID-19 are already nearly full. Ian? All right, Talia, thank you. For more on this, let's bring in Dr. Isaac Bogosh. Dr. Bogosh is part of Ontario's Vaccine Distribution Task Force and an infectious diseases specialist in Toronto. And, and what do you expect to see in Ontario ICUs in the next few weeks? Yeah, sadly, I think things are going to get worse. We see growing case counts. We haven't yet realized any of the benefits of the lockdown measures that were only enacted a few days ago. It's going to take at least a couple of weeks before we see any benefit from that. Uh, so sadly, we're going to see larger uh, growing case numbers per day and sadly more people admitted to the ICUs in an already 
uh, stretch beyond capacity healthcare system. So sad, as you say, inevitable to an extent, because this is reflecting infections that, that happened uh, weeks ago. What should we be doing right now, though, to slow the spread? In all fairness, this is going to be a lot of policy, right? We need sound policy to really ensure that we can curb transmission in all parts of Ontario. We also need support, support, support for essential workers that just don't have that luxury of locking down or stay and staying home. And finally, we need to vaccinate like stink and get vaccines into those high burden communities, into those workplaces, and into the arms of uh, individuals who are, you know, unfortunately at, at significant risk of getting this infection. Dr. Bogosh, thank you. My pleasure. And we're going to get a first hand look at the difficult scenes unfolding in some hospitals. Uh, I know it'll be okay. I, 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 we're not losing hope. We'll take you inside an ICU in a Toronto COVID hotspot to get the perspective of patients, family and staff. That's tomorrow night on The National. Among the many people who have struggled with COVID in ICU, 34-year-old Matthew Cardinal of Regina. He's now recovering at home. You'll see him in a prone position. That helps his breathing. And he begins with the moment he was admitted. And they told me, you have about 10 minutes before we take you down to ICU. So text or call your family. We need to take you down there now before you start losing your brain function. And it was scary. So I posted on Facebook, hey, friends and family, if I don't make it, this is goodbye. Like the nurse I was working that night, she was shaking with fear. Like she, like she was freaking out. I, my vitals were crashing and I was really scared. I had no idea that it would be all these cords and everything coming out of my mouth. They would take me out of the coma every once in a while. Like, and I had no idea what time it was, how long I was under. It literally crippled me. Like I need oxygen. I need a walker to like to walk around. Like I really had to work hard to get out of the hospital so I can recover at home. Because the hospitals here are so full, they really need the beds. Matthew Cardinal speaking to CBC News just two days after leaving ICU. We're following a developing story tonight in Montreal. A crowd gathered there to protest against the newly imposed earlier curfew time. This was the scene after the curfew set in. According to the latest rules, residents of Montreal and Laval now need to get home by 8 p.m. or risk a fine. Matt Demore is in Montreal tonight. Matt, tell us where you are and, and what's happening. Well, Ian, right now I'm near the uh, area in Old Montreal where this demonstration was taking place. Now, we knew that there was going to be a protest tonight against these uh, stricter measures that are coming to effect in Montreal and, uh, and Laval, north of Montreal. Uh, what we didn't know was how large it was going to be and what the outcome was going to be. And you, you've seen these images, large gatherings. We've seen uh, younger people in this demonstration, and we also saw a, a fire being lit we heard reports of firecrackers and fireworks. And in fact, on my way over here, I saw some fireworks being uh, shot off into the air. You could hear in the distance an, an unmistakable sound of riot police officers uh, hitting their shields with batons. So there are riot police officers on the scene right now. We've seen ambulances and uh, fire trucks come in. And I've seen a couple of firefighters uh, using an extinguisher. Uh, now, most of the people who were at that meeting point seem to have dispersed. And police have actually formed a, a, a sort of a, a cordon around this area. They've blocked off all the access into this area into Old Montreal. And actually, while I was coming over here, I overheard the younger people. I don't know if they were in the demonstration, but I overheard people saying, there's no way we're getting out of here without a fine. So police have moved in. People seem to have dispersed, majoritively from the area where the protest was happening. Firefighters were called on the scene. But this demonstration happening uh, because of these stricter measures, including this 8 p.m. curfew. It was 9.30 p.m. for a while in Montreal. It is now at 8 o'clock, and it seems that there are a lot of people, at least the ones who showed up here tonight, who are very unhappy about that fact. All right, Matt, thank you very much, and we'll keep an eye on this through the evening. Also, some tense moments outside in Alberta Church today. Hundreds of demonstrators showing up to protest after it was shut down and fenced off because of a refusal to follow COVID safety rules. Oh, yeah, they're they're going to cut this into a 30-second segment. 
Some people in the crowd tore down a section of the fence and shouted at police. Others shouted back at them and instead sang hymns and praying. Alberta Health Services says Grace Life Church will stay closed until it shows that people will comply with public health measures. The church and its pastor are charged under the Public Health Act with breaking restrictions around capacity, masking and physical distancing. Now let's take a look at where Canada stands getting vaccines into arms. Across the country, 18.7% of Canadians have received at least one dose, with rates highest in the north. Quebec is at 22%, and Nova Scotia the lowest in the country at less than 11%. The rate of fully vaccinated Canadians much lower, 2%. And remember, the threshold to reach herd immunity is around 70%. Among those now eligible to get a shot in parts of the country, teachers and other education workers. But as Briar Stewart tells us, the regional rollouts are a patchwork with many educators still waiting for their turn. I think that teachers and all essential workers need to be vaccinated. I think for the past two days, this kindergarten before. teacher has lined up to try and see if there are extra doses left at the end of the day at vaccination clinics and he'll keep doing so until he receives a shot. If we're going to be mandated to work, uh, then we need to have the additional protection. Uh, the situation has changed. Uh, cases are on the rise, the variants are on the rise. BC had planned to vaccinate all essential workers, including teachers with the AstraZeneca vaccine, but that rollout is now on hold because of concerns that the shot could be linked to rare blood clots. Instead, the province is now focusing only on hot spots. In Ontario, some teachers in Toronto and Peel, where there's high transmission, will start to get their shot this week. But in Niagara, the health region is moving to vaccinate all of its teachers. Wednesday's the big day, yes. Tina Lisi knows how dangerous the virus can be as her brother-in-law, a retired firefighter, died after contracting it. It was quite a shock. It made it very real that this, this, is, this is very real uh, thing that's happening. So couldn't be happier to be getting to be getting vaccination. In New Brunswick, teachers started getting their vaccine last month, but elsewhere, educators are still waiting. We wish we could uh, vaccinate uh, teachers and everybody as soon as possible, but it, it depends on supply. Alberta is distributing 400,000 rapid test kits to schools, while in Vancouver, schools are getting 1,200 kits. These tests can be done at home, then taken to a lab. I realize there is a lot of anxiety and concern, um, and we want to make sure that uh, things are as easy as possible for families, kids and schools. Because even though nearly one million people in B.C. have received their first dose, cases are still surging. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper got his first dose of the COVID vaccine. He posted this tweet on Saturday, encouraging all eligible Canadians to get vaccinated to beat the pandemic. Just a few hours later, Justin Trudeau replied, thanking Stephen Harper, calling on Canadians to work together. But elsewhere, party lines are hardening in anticipation of a possible spring election. Over the weekend, both the Liberals and the NDP held conventions to work out policy. As Olivia Stefanovic shows us, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh gave signs of his strategy even as he faced the judgment of his party. You're going to have to put yourself off a of mute. It didn't go as smoothly as the party had hoped. I would like to see the party postpone the entire convention. The challenges of a remote a, convention a were glaring. Cherry picking is happening with the speaker's list and it is completely unacceptable. I know a lot of you at home are frustrated. I'm frustrated. I think I'm, I'm losing my hair. But the NDP pushed through its technical glitches to rally behind the leader. It is really because of you that we have been able to achieve significant victories for people. Three years after his last leadership review, Singh won his party's approval easily with 87 percent support. You know what we've seen in this pandemic is that the Liberals like to take credit, but New Democrats like to get results. Singh used his speech to draw a sharp contrast between his party and Justin Trudeau's. Together, we get to choose a brighter future. Together, we get to grab hold of a once-in-a-generation moment to build the kind of tomorrow we all want to see. 
The NDP's tomorrow looks a lot like the Liberals. But Singh says the future would be much brighter with more new Democrats, who he says fought harder for Canadians. That is exactly the strategy that he needs to pursue. With the NDP stuck in third place in the polls, this strategist says Singh needs to pull disaffected voters from the Liberals to get ahead. That's the reason why Jagmeet Singh is reminding people of that and distinguishing himself as a true progressive who's going to actually deliver. But some NDP delegates want the party to be even more progressive. For the NDP, it's a missed opportunity to be bold. At the end of this weekend, Singh emerges from the convention with solid backing and a strong hand to direct the party's course in the face of a looming election. Olivia Stefanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. We're learning more details about the plans for Prince Philip's funeral set for next weekend, including that Prince Harry will be there. Renee Filipponi now on the hope that that's giving some that family rifts could be healed. At a small Sunday service in Windsor today, Princes Andrew and Edward shared their grief. It's been a bit of a, a bit of a shock, however much one tries to prepare oneself for, for something like this. Still coming to terms with Prince Philip's death, their thoughts are with their mother, the Queen. She described it as, as, as having left a huge void uh, in her life. Um, but we, um, the family, the ones that are, that are, that are closer, are, are rallying around. Rare public comments from Andrew, who's kept a low profile amid controversy since 2019. A special service was also held at Canterbury Cathedral by the Archbishop, who is expected to lead the funeral on Saturday. No words can reach into the depth of sorrow that goes into bereavement. It will be held at St. George's Chapel on the grounds of Windsor Castle, a scaled-back event not only because of COVID restrictions, but also at the request of the Duke himself. It's going to be a very intimate service. This royal commentator says there will be military elements in a family procession, walking behind a custom Land Rover with the Duke's coffin, with the exception of the Queen. The public will have to watch on TV. It'll be quite a grand funeral. Windsor Castle is, is a very grand backdrop, but at the heart of it will be the family. That, that tells you a lot about Prince Philip. Only 30 people will be able to attend. The palace will release details on the guest list this Thursday. One person on it will be Prince Harry. It will be his first time back in the UK since breaking with the royal family and moving to the US. In Windsor, there is a sense of anticipation for his return. It will be great for Harry to come back as a family, to be as, as part of family. His wife, Meghan, who is pregnant, is following doctor's orders and staying in the US. And some hope with Prince Harry's presence, it could help mend rifts with the family. I think it'll, there'll be private reconciliation and there'll be public pictures of them together. The death of Prince Philip bringing the family together, all connected by their loss. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Tributes to American rap legend DMX have been pouring in from fellow artists. The 50-year-old dying on Friday after struggling on life support for several days following a heart attack. I love you, X. I love you too, my brother. And I ain't afraid to say hey, From Snoop Dogg to Viola Davis and Kay Trinata, artists call him an inspiration who touched so many through his music. I know that my savior lives, and at the end, he will stand on this earth. My flesh may be destroyed, yet from this body, I will see God. DMX first broke into the rap scene in 1998. His debut album, the first of five in a row to top the Billboard Albums chart in the United States. DMX is survived by his mother and his 15 children. Long live DMX to great. A school custodian who refused to install an app on her phone that monitors location says she was fired. Employers have been using software to monitor workers during the pandemic. The former custodian decided to go public and told her story to our Erica Johnson. Michelle Dion says she felt good heading to her new job last fall, doing extra COVID cleaning at an elementary school. With the pandemic that's going on, I felt like I was an important part of the team. But a few weeks after getting hired, her boss told everyone they had to download an app on their personal phones to make sure they were showing up and to track their hours. It was just a statement, a blanket statement. Everybody install this app on their phones. 
In pandemic times, an increasing number of workers are being asked to download software that helps employers remotely monitor productivity. In Dion's case, the app her boss wanted her to download was called Blip. It works by creating a virtual boundary, or geofence, around an area an employer defines. Using GPS, it tracks when a worker enters and exits the geofence area. According to Alberta's privacy legislation, in a case like this, the location of an employee is considered personal employee information. Dion knew other apps had been hacked and worried her personal information was at risk. She believes refusing to download the app led to getting fired a few weeks later. This was just a shock. The owner of the school cleaning company says the app simplified payroll and says it wasn't the only reason Dion was fired. As we move forward um, of implementing new procedures and policies, she wasn't in agreement of them. This employment lawyer says workers are being asked to give up too much personal information. We don't even know who we're giving it up to and where it's going and what is happening to it. And before it's too late and we go down some slippery slope, it's, it's time that we looked at this. The federal government tabled what's called a digital charter last fall. It's making its way through the House. It's aimed at giving more protections to people working in the private sector and concerned about their personal information. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. A worsening situation is developing in the Caribbean island of St. Vincent. Thousands flee their homes as more volcanic eruptions spew ash and cause power outages. Plus, after six seasons with the Raptors, Norm Powell talks about the shock of being traded. You know, I, I just love, I love, I love the, the city of Toronto. And a familiar drum beat gets new life. The music they were able to find uh, wasn't coming from authentic indigenous sources. A music library with a unique offering made here in Canada. This is a very hard night for thousands of people on the Caribbean island of St. Vincent. A volcano erupting again today after the first big blast on Friday. People looked up and there is this huge plume of ash hanging in the sky. Silent, deadly, dreadful, ominous. All of that dust and ash descending to earth as a blanket of misery. St. Vincent is in the Eastern Caribbean, among other islands, above South America. Here again is Matt Damore with the pain being felt in Canada. The volcano just blow and you can see a lot of ashes. Farida Nanton captured these moments after the volcanic eruption Friday, but this was just the beginning. Another explosive event came this morning. Farida's sister Sandra in Montreal has desperately tried to stay in constant contact, but it hasn't been easy. It went out. It went out? Yeah. Did that happen often? Yeah. Back on the line, Farida describes what she saw. This one this morning was the biggest one so far because it was very loud and you can feel the tremors. So it, it, it was quite scary and the lightning was flashing because there was a total blackout. But when the lightning flashed, it was lighting up the whole country. People here now frustrated by shortages of power and water as a blanket of ash covers everything in sight. 16,000 people have had to abandon their homes. For Sandra Nanton, it's hard to watch from so far away as her family struggles. It's very uh, emotional too because uh, in a minute you might hear it's another explosion and then that explosion could go to the worst. The St. Vincent and the Grenadines Association of Montreal is preparing to send all the help it can. The group will hold a donation drive for urgently needed essentials like non-perishable food and clothes. And it has contacted a Canadian shipping company to deliver the supplies. And they have given us the assurance they will take it to St. Vincent for us free of cost. So we're going to get it, call them, they'll come and pick it up. Or we will take it to them, whichever is faster, because 
time is of the essence. Scientists warn eruptions could continue to shake St. Vincent for days, even weeks, with thousands uncertain when they can go back home. Matt Damour, CBC News, Montreal. The world has been closely watching a murder trial in Minneapolis, that of the former police officer charged in the killing of George Floyd. And as Helen Morrow shows us, one of the Floyd family's most prominent supporters spoke today about the fight for justice. We are going to demand justice by any means necessary. Outside the courthouse, pain and purpose. Demonstrators hopeful for a guilty verdict, anxious it won't come. We've seen a litany of police uh, killings that have not gone uh, addressed by the criminal justice system. Reverend Al Sharpton, a Floyd family confidant, told CBC News the justice system itself is on trial. If we can't, with a videotape, of nine minutes and 29 seconds of a man's knee, a policeman's knee on a man's neck, while the man is begging for his life. If we can't get a, a conviction here, then many people will feel there's no way to get justice. A parade of medical experts testified last week that George Floyd's death was a homicide. There's no evidence to suggest he would have died that night except for the interactions with law enforcement. You conducted the autopsy on Mr. George Floyd. I did. Dr. Andrew Baker conceded to the defense that Floyd's heart condition and drug use may have contributed, but he said, They are not direct causes of Mr. Floyd's death. I would still classify it as a homicide today. The trial is roughly halfway through, every day marked by gripping testimony. Every day, painful to watch, says Azri Yeager. I'm only 15, so like, I'm just seeing this stuff nonstop. Like so many, the Minneapolis teen protested last spring. He fears Chauvin will be acquitted despite the expert testimony. The world we live in, like, I have to be prepared for it to, for it to not be a great outcome and be prepared for protests again. That outcome, the verdict, is expected before the end of the month. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. And more on the impact of George Floyd's death, this time on the NBA. Norm Powell, the former Raptors shooting guard, was becoming a scoring powerhouse, but off the court, he faced a different reality. I've been harassed and still, you know, the police officers don't know that I'm an NBA player, you know, that so many my conversation with the basketball star is next. Welcome back. During this pandemic, everyone has dealt with their own set of challenges, and it's been no different for former Toronto Raptors player Norm Powell. I recently caught up with him, and we talked about the past year playing in a pandemic, dealing with racism, and his love for Toronto. Huge shot by Terrence Ross, and there's the rookie. Norman Powell with a steal and a dunk. If you know basketball, you know Norm Powell. Norman Powell with the exclamation point. For nearly six years, he was admired for his leave it all on the floor approach and, of course, being part of Toronto's NBA championship team. Hey, man, hey, shout out to Toronto, shout out to the city. Man, shout out to Canada, shout out to Drake, shout out to all of them, man. I love the support, man. Keep going, man. We brought a championship home to y'all, man. We did it for you, man. I'm so excited. I'm so proud, man. Let's go. Off the court, Powell was a leader when the Raptors struggled to cope with the killing of George Floyd. Pretty tired and sick to my stomach to have to sit up here and talk about this again and continue this long fight that we've been fighting. After dealing with the summer of racial reckoning and living out of a suitcase as the Raptors stayed south of the border during the pandemic, Powell was just traded to Portland and forced to say goodbye to his fans in Toronto through a letter in the Players' Tribune. We caught up with Norm Powell in his new home after an emotional few weeks. Norm Powell, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. It has not been long since your trade from Toronto to Portland, I know the immediate uh, aftermath was was kind of tough for you. How are you feeling about that now? Um, I feel good now. You know, after you know, uh, you have some time to let everything sink in, emotions. You know, you let them go and uh, realize that you got to stay in the present moment and uh, do your job. Uh, you know, I'm excited to be in Portland. They've been a great organization. Everybody's been so welcoming and kind, 
and uh, helping uh, me have a smooth transition here. What's it been like playing professional basketball during the pandemic? It's been uh, interesting. Everything's been changed. Everything's different. You know, we have so many different protocols that we have to follow. You know, limited time outside, limited time seeing family and friends. It's tough, you know, because I've been on the road. I've been living out of a suitcase pretty much. I haven't been in a place particularly for a set period of time. So it's been tiring and a lot of adjusting, a lot of having to battle through mental fortitude just to be focused and having to go out there and do your job. This virus is serious and we have to take all the precautions and protocols necessary to keep not only ourselves safe, but our loved ones safe as well. Let me ask you about another serious topic and, and take us into the dressing room after the killing of George Floyd. What, what was the impact on you? What was the impact on players in the NBA? Yeah, that was, uh, that was tough. You know, um, it was very stressful for me. Um, it's tough, you know, to, to see that constantly. You know, it's not just the first time seeing somebody killed due to police brutality uh, or excessive use of force. Uh, it's frustrating for me. I've voiced my opinions and I've been really big on police reform and uh, holding police to a higher standard to the law. And uh, it was frustrating. I know a lot of people were, were upset, especially guys on our team. It, it was disturbing and disgusting. When you think about it still, you know, it, it bothers me. The NBA and its players certainly made it very clear that, uh, that there was an opportunity to speak out. There was an opportunity to, to wear your message on your back. But you had an interesting perspective on that. I want to play a clip from last year, you talking about the limited number of slogans that the NBA allowed on the back of the jersey. We're going to play that clip now. I felt like the list was very cookie cutter and uh, really doesn't really touch the topics of, of what we're trying to achieve here. It's a topic where it's freedom of speech, you know, and, and, and you're taking your name um, off the back of your jersey to, to put something that, that, that matters to you because it is your last name that you're removing. You know, it, it's you, you know, and, and it speaks to uh, yourself. So um, uh, I don't think there should have been a list at all. Norm, what message would you like to put on the back of your jersey or, or at least back then? I really wanted to go with uh, a message of Am I Next? That really spoke to me. Um, it's something that uh, uh, is really close to me and, and my heart growing up, being an uh, African-American uh, in this world growing up. My mom always told me about, you know, how my color, uh, the color of my skin is, is a weapon, you know, and uh, the way I have to act and be in certain times and uh, where I need to be with uh, in interactions with uh, law enforcement. You know, uh, she was always scared for me when I was out uh, and about with my friends, with a group of friends um, in the neighborhood that I grew up in. You know, I think people believe that because I'm an athlete, because I'm a, uh, in the NBA, uh, I'm removed from uh, what goes on um, in, in neighborhoods and communities of minorities. You know, and, and just because I'm in the NBA, I don't see that or, or feel that. Police officers don't know that I'm an NBA player. You know, there, there's so many of us, unless you're LeBron James or guys that are in the limelight like that, you know, they just see us as uh, uh, another person. When I'm driving around or uh, back home in my community and I have my cars and things like that, I'm always scared that, you know, a car's, uh, police officer is going to pull up behind me and, and suspect that, you know, the car is stolen or whatever because of the type of cars that I drive and who's driving them. Um, it, it still worries me uh, going back home in my community because they don't know. I was pulled over uh, when I was in college going to UCLA and I was with uh, my girlfriend at the time. Um, and she was, uh, she was white. And the first thing they did was question her. Was she safe? Is, is she in harm's way? This and the other. And then questioning me and my, my friend, like, are we gang members? This and the other. And I remember telling them, like, you don't even know who you're talking to. Like, I, I go to UCLA, I'm an honor roll I'm on the UCLA men's basketball team. Like, you can Google me this and the other. And when he went back to his patrol car, he came back and had a totally different demeanor with me. You know, but before he was asking me if I was a gang member and all this and the other, uh, because I was back home in my southeast uh, San Diego community and I had a white girl in the, in the front seat, you know, and right there it just shows you that it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your career is or, or what you're doing. You know, they, they see you one way. Um, and I won't say all of them do, but uh, a lot of them do, you yeah. know, and I'm not, I'm not exempt from that just because of however much money I make or what my profession is. So let's make a happier turn now. You, you mentioned Toronto. Uh, what do you miss about Toronto other than all the love? Is there anything else? Um, I miss the city. Uh, uh, I'm a very big vibe person. Um, and um, I thought I touched on that uh, in my letter uh, to Toronto. Um, just the vibe and the feel that I got when I first got there. You know, I, I, I've loved it. Um, I was staying in a high rise condo and I always loved just being able to look out 
uh, at the at Lake Ontario and, and, uh, and the skyline view of, of downtown and just uh, really take all that in. You know, I'm gonna miss Copacabana. That's my, my favorite spot to go to um, <laughs> downtown. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I really love the vibe of Toronto and the feel of just being there and um, uh, how diverse it was, how friendly everybody was. I just love, I love, I love the, the city of Toronto. Norm, in that article in the Players' Tribune, you talked about how Kyle Lowry told you that uh, you will be a Raptor forever. You'll be part of that championship team forever. And it meant a lot to you. Um, yeah, you know, um, it meant a lot to me, you know, now that I'm able to sit back and think about it. You know, I'm not a player who uh, always talks about himself or looks back at everything that he's accomplished and things like that. But uh, now that I'm away from it and looking back at everything that, you know, I was able to do and, you know, achieve uh, in my time in Toronto, uh, it means a lot, you know, to be etched in, in history that, you know, people will talk about uh, what you've done uh, for the city, uh, for the team, uh, for the country uh, forever. Even I wouldn't have been able to dream about as, as a kid. Um, so uh, I'm going to hold that near and dear to my heart. Norm Powell, thank you so much. No, thanks for having me. When you do an interview with a professional athlete, you never really know unless you've met them before. You never know until you do the interview what they'll be like. He was generous with his time. We had to kind of mess around a little bit with the technical setup. And as you can see, really nice guy. He cannot wait for that post-pandemic moment when Portland plays Toronto and he gets to go back to the city that he clearly loves. Prince Philip is being remembered this week for a program that empowered youth. 65 years, 144 countries, and countless lives changed. It's essentially launched me on a completely different career path. The legacy of the Duke of Edinburgh awards next. Flowers and tributes to Prince Philip continue to pile up outside Windsor Castle, where he passed away on Friday at the age of 99. His funeral will be held on Saturday. Philip was involved in hundreds of organizations and charities, but he's perhaps best known for founding the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Nick Purden spoke with some Canadians who say it changed their lives. As a 13-year-old, I would go to school, I'd come home, I'd play computer games. I was someone who loved to eat junk food. Growing up in New Brunswick, Jane Thornton was headed in the wrong direction. I think it would have been very easy for me to go down a path of smoking, drugs, alcohol, that kind of thing. Today, Jane's a long way from that. This is how she kicks off her day. What turned her life around? An award that was started by Prince Philip. The Duke of Edinburgh Award, so I enrolled in a critical time in my life and without it I certainly wouldn't be where I am today. It's essentially launched me on a completely different career path but also on um, a path in, in sport that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have imagined. And the Canadians in lane number two. Jane went all the way to the Olympics and placed fourth in Beijing in 2008. She credits her transformation to the discipline and support she got doing the Duke of Edinburgh Award. That was the trigger that really set everything off in the right direction. I certainly would not have attained that uh, really unique opportunity of representing Canada at the Olympics. She's a Duke of Edinburgh Award winner. Had I been able, as an older me, to talk to the 13-year-old and say, listen, you know, just get into this and, you know, you'll go to the Olympics. I think that that 13-year-old would have just said, you know, you're crazy. Like, who are you? Get out. <laughs> it was teenagers Prince Philip had in mind when he came up with his award in 1956. His goal was to motivate them to become better people. To do that, they have to volunteer, go on an expedition, learn new skills, and maintain their physical fitness. In Canada, half a million kids have participated. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. But the award is not just a thing of the past. Today, thousands of Canadian kids sign up every year, like these teenagers in Charlottetown. All right, my name is Joelle McPhee, and I actually went to this school. And I did the award a long time ago. I was a pretty like shy, nerdy kid, and I didn't really do much really outside of school and hang out with friends. And Joelle uses her own experience to get the kids interested in the award. A lot of teens are just like she was, in need of a little encouragement to pursue their dreams. I knew that I wanted to leave PEI and go to school in a city, and I knew that I'd heard that 
the Duke of Edinburgh program would help uh, my chances at a scholarship and school applications. That's why Joelle decided to try for the award. And she had no idea it would lead her literally to the edge. We went rock climbing and I remember being on a rock, <laughs> just completely terrified and just thinking to myself like, who are you? Like, what are you even doing right now? And it was like this adrenaline rush. And I think about, you know, all of the things I've done since then, like, you know, I climbed Machu Picchu with a friend last year. Like, it's, it's just something that I think I've realized, you know, when you can push yourself and you get through it, it's just, it stays with you. So when it came to university, I actually ended up getting a full scholarship to my top choice in Canada. Because what Joelle I, learned because I, she lived it grades, is how much a teenager can benefit from structure and a little push. That was Thompson Egbo Egbo's story. Today, he's an accomplished pianist, but his life wasn't always easy. His parents brought him to Canada as a little kid from Nigeria. You know, for me, the Duke of Edinburgh Award is a very crucial piece in my life. You know, if I think about my life without the award, there's a lot of opportunities I would have missed out on. Okay, ready. <laughs> Today, Thompson is dedicated to paying it forward. I look out for kids because, you know, when I was growing up, I had two really, really lovely parents. I had the Duke of Edinburgh Award and was able to, say, blossom and develop into the person I am because of them. And I helped because I saw a lot of kids who didn't have awesome. that. Good job, buddy. And so, you know, one of the reasons why I give back is that I think you know, early on, if, if, you know, a few more kids can kind of get into some of these programs, um, it may just kind of change, you know, be, be that butterfly effect, right, that changes the whole world for them. Those are the opportunities that could really, for some kids, mean life and death, but also could just mean, you know, a different type of life, contributing to the world in their own community in a different way. It would have been impossible for Prince Philip to know how much his award helped all the kids who've taken it. But he wasn't just a figurehead. Whenever he could, he handed out the award himself. That's what happened to Paul Winnick. Today, he chairs Alberta's COVID-19 vaccine task force. The memory of meeting the Duke, it was very powerful to me. It just kind of opened the world for me at the age of 17. I have very fond memories of my journey through the award. I would say it gave me kind of a toolkit for life. It gives you perseverance, determination, a sense of community. When Paul went to his award ceremony, Prince Philip helped him make the biggest decision of his life. I was an army cadet. I was thinking about joining the army. Uh, my late father was a Second World War uh, veteran. And although I think he wanted me to join the army, he uh, certainly wasn't forcing me to uh, by any means. But I specifically remember receiving the award and the Duke kind of looked me up and down. He didn't congratulate me. He just said, young man, you should join the army. And I did, and I was fortunate enough to command the Canadian Army 30 years later. In an organization as large and diverse as the Canadian Army... Paul Winnick rose all the way to Vice Chief of Defence Staff, the second highest rank in the Canadian Armed Forces. Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, is gone. But his award will live on and continue to change the lives of youth across the country. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. Indigenous creators say it's the first of a kind. And it's going to change the sounds we hear in film and television productions. We'll explain in our moment. This music is part of Nagamo Publishing. Indigenous creators started up what is essentially a catalog of different types of music created by Indigenous musicians that will be available to film and television productions. They say they were surprised to find they are the first Indigenous venture of this kind in the world. CBC Toronto's Maravel Tarouk spoke with the creators of Nagamo, and that is our moment. Nagamo is an Ojibwe word meaning sing. Uh, it's a command, sing. Um, and whether it's the drum singing or it's our vocals singing or it's the music singing in itself. It was 
standard in the industry for a while if you needed that kind of sound just to give it to any old composer and throw some shakers and some rattles and some drums and call it a day. Indigenous music, people are often going to think of traditional music and we want to certainly provide that but we also provide just great production music that fits in, in various genres. <laughs> There's a real need for it, there's a gap there, and there's a lot of talent in Canada, indigenous musical talent, that we want to showcase and provide an access point to. It really is brilliant. I was listening to some on my phone just a second ago, so you need the technology we have now, and you need this kind of maybe moment in history, right, where people respect the creativity and the culture, and they don't just, as we just heard, kind of create some music that sounds right, but they can actually find what they want. That is The National for April 11th. Good night.